So last week, we, uh, we started and we had a bit of a story that, was tell, that we told. And so we had some fun around the story. If you weren't here, we spoke a bit about Mary and Elizabeth and uh, looked at a different aspect maybe of their story. But we said that more important than stories and more important than histories is his story. And being part of his stories. And so today we want to look at another one of his stories. And we're going to be focusing around the wise men today. Are you guys ready? Yes. Awesome. Let's get into it. So, once upon a time, as we've established, that's how story should start. There was a boy. We don't know much about this boy because his name is as mysterious as his history. So we don't really know. So we decided this morning that we're going to be calling him Anonymous. But Anonymous doesn't have a real ring to it, so maybe we'll call him Anonymous the Wise. But that's too long, so maybe we'll just call him the Wise. And then just shorten and call him the Wise. So today we want to chat about the Wise and his family. There's only one real event in the Wise's life that we know uh, for certain. But it is the most important and life-defining occurrence that has ever been documented. It is what the historians, or if what the historians have discovered are even partly true, then he was part of the most amazing journey predicted over many centuries and the destination being so much more than what they could ever hope, ask, or imagine for. Excuse the punt for a second there. You guys ready? Yes. Theowise tells his story to us. He says this. We are from the tribe called, known as the Magi, and have been in the court of many kings serving as wise men. Not to be mistaken as wise guys, as we sometimes know. We have been in the courts of many kings serving as dream interpreters, as well as studying and reading the stars. Our tribe has always been known to be wise and powerful, and because of this, kings have listened to us and paid attention to the things we say, and the knowledge that we possess has been passed down through the ages. But there is a prophecy, a prophecy of one to come, about a king, a king that is more important than any other. I first heard about this prophecy from my grandfather. He always gets so excited when he mentions it. And it is a prophecy that has been passed down through many centuries. My grandfather told me of a man in the court of Nebuchadnezzar who believed in God and in the God of the Israelites. This man, Balthazar, as the king called him, was able to not only interpret dreams, but his God also gave him the ability to tell the dream before he interpreted. The king told Nebuchadnezzar, or he told Nebuchadnezzar, that his dream was about a statue made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, and clay, which represented the different kingdoms that would be destroyed by the stone, or maybe a rock, or even maybe a star. And we have been looking for the star ever since. That is an amazing star, but it's not the one they were looking for. <laughs> Daniel, as he's known to the his people, spoke uh, a prophecy that foretold of a ruler to come. Turn over. The prophecy of a king, a king that will be greater than all kings before, was exciting to the Magi, and they've been carrying it for many years. My father believes that the new strange star that has appeared in the sky will lead us to this king. Maybe the star could even be the one that Daniel spoke about. We have read the scriptures, and we know how important this king will be. We have always been there when kings were established. Such a king as this one that is foretold needs to be honored and worshipped. My father and some of his colleagues have even gathered together some of the most valuable gifts they could find. And we are ready to leave everything behind as we seek this king to worship him. The journey was always going to be part of our destiny. And now it has become the end. Or maybe for us today, the beginning. So we just use some fun to tell a story. But such an important thing that we learn through this. And, and the magi that they refer to, the, which is the word that is used in the, in the New Testament, or magos is the, the single, uh, singular of that, tells us of these wise men. And there are many histories that are told around or many stories around that. But we are going to be focusing on just one of those that is probably the most probable of where they've come from. And I think it's important for us today to see that they weren't just lowly, lowly wanderers in the desert. They just happened to come upon a star one day. They were actually through history, looking at things, reading the stars, knowing about things that have, has been happening, that has been foretold. And so they were excited about this moment. It was a big moment within their life. And so the first time we hear about these wise men 
is in the book of Genesis. And in Genesis, we see a word by, uh, that is used there. The Hebrew word is chakim, uh, which is very similar to the word for magi in the New Testament. And so we read about them there. It says, the next morning, Pharaoh was very dis- disturbed by the dreams. So he called for, a ma- for the magicians and wise men of Egypt. When Pharaoh told them his dreams, not one of them could tell him what they meant. This word here, as I said, chakim, refers to wise, intelligent, skillful, artful, cunning, crafty and learned men so they were highly trained in all the sciences of the day they could read the signs and they could tell the kings what was to come and plan and uh, across all the different spaces that was available to them then we see another occurrence which we sort of referred to in our story when daniel said daniel replied there are no no wise men enchanters magicians or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. It's interesting there that he mentions the wise men together with all the other things. So they weren't just magicians or or just astrologers, but they knew a lot of things. And actually Daniel was eventually appointed uh, the head governor above all the magi. So they got some information uh, through him as well. And so they saw many things, and through the generations, they were reading the signs, they were looking at different things, and they were excited about this prophecy that was about to come. And they might have laid out certain things that they seen in the stars and the only interpretations of everything but every time they met up with a man of god every time they were confronted with god with their dream the dreams that they were reading they saw something different in that moment and they could learn from that it left an impact within their lives so if we see these men that were powerful and were able to read many things and that they were wise and that they could read the signs of the time and that the kings were trusting in them and these kind of men were willing to leave everything they had and to go on a journey to find a king then i think there are some things that we might be able to learn from them some things from this journey why they had decided to do this and why they had gone so we see that these men went on a journey and at one stage they find themselves in the court of herod uh, and because he is the king and they go straight to him to find out where this new king will be which didn't turn out to be such a great idea but they weren't part of that world they were part of another world and so i want to look at this point of of not being or rather being in this world but not of it and so we we are in this world but we are not of it and, and in this world we uh, the, the the reference in in the uh, old testament where it talks about egypt when we talk about that today refer it to today we're talking about the world so when we read egypt keep that in mind that we are looking at the world so let's see what what we hear here um Paul is talking to the Gentiles, and he says this to them. At that time, you did not know about Christ. You were foreigners to the people of Israel. You had no part of the promises that God had made to them. You were living in this world without hope and without God. And so that's where we were found before we found Christ. It's almost like where these these, uh, magi was, where the wise men were. They were without God. They hadn't found him yet, but they were looking. And that's where we were in the world, not having the answer yet. Then Jesus says this. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love for the Father. So we see that there's, there's this whole principle of being part of something or within something, but not necessarily part of it, or not giving ourselves into it. And so when we are found in the world, we are part of this, we are called within this world, but we are not part of this world. We are called to be separate. We are called to stand out within this. We are called to be in the world and active in it, but not to be part of it. Make sense? So interesting fact that we see if we look across the ages is that Joseph, original Joseph in the Old Testament, he was, he was uh, taken to Egypt and served in Pharaoh's court. And what he did is he invited Israel into Egypt because his dad's name, Jacob, was changed to Israel. So he invited the family of Israel into Egypt. They grew in Egypt, and eventually the king wanted to get rid of them. The king wanted to kill them. He was there to des- wanted to destroy them um, and put a lot of pain on them. And then God sent Moses to get the Israelites out of Egypt. Then we see that here in the New Testament, when, when uh, Jesus is born and the, uh, these men come, these wise men come to look for him, they bring the, to the attention of the current king, Herod, that there is another king to come. And we find that then, the, the God, uh, then God, wish, uh, sorry, God warns Joseph to run because the king is going to kill Jesus. And where does Joseph run to? He runs to Egypt. 
He goes to hide in Egypt. And there's an important portion why he went to Egypt. We read um, in Matthew, it says here, After the wise men left, and the angel from the Lord came to Joseph in a dream, the angel said, Get up, take the child with his mother, and escape to Egypt. Herod wants to kill the child, and soon st- and you'll still start, soon start looking for him. Stay in Egypt until I tell you to come back. Joseph stayed in Egypt until Herod died. This gave full meaning to what the Lord said through the prophets, I'll call my son to come out of Egypt. So Jesus was hidden in Egypt and he was called to come out of Egypt. We are in Egypt, in this world, but we are called not to be part of it. We are called out of Egypt. God has done this. Continue with us in the world, but come out of it. Come out of it. And and here's the interesting thing. Jesus was in Egypt because the king wanted to kill him. He was called out of it when the king wasn't there anymore. The Israelites were in Egypt and the king wanted to kill them. The ruler of the space wanted to kill them and come out. In our world today, the ruler of this world, the enemy, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's there to call us and God calls us out of that. That we don't have to be part of those things. So we are not found, we are not from this world. In John, we see, I have given them your word. This is Jesus talking to the Father. And the world hates them because they do not belong to the world. Just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. We are part of this world. We don't separate ourselves from it. We don't pull us out of it, but we, we, we expect God's protection within it to do the things that He's called us within it, to be the light within it, and to make a difference within this world because we know that we have Him on it. Even Jesus didn't feel like He was part of this world, but He came to do what He needed to do. Just as you sent me into the world, Jesus says, I am sending them into the world. We are sent into this world, but we are not we don't have to be part of this world. We don't have to partake of the things that they do. We don't have to ta- partake of those things that hurts our spirit, that, that makes us confused, that distracts from what God has called us. If we can be pa- in amongst all of it, but we don't have to be part of what this world does. I'm hoping that God will reveal this in your heart, that you can be the difference maker within the space that you are at. The Magi represented all the wisdom of the time. They were like the the ones that had all the knowledge of all the sciences that were available at the time. And they knew everything that was was to be known, uh, so to say. They acquired this knowledge uh, and many things that had been passed through the different ages. And they had spiritual strength and understanding. even, uh, Even though they were the most powerful men of the day, they still came and bowed to the king. They had all the wisdom that was available, but they bowed to the king. They had all the authority, economical, spiritual authority in the time because kings went to them for answers, but they came and they bowed to this king. They were made lowly before the king because God uses the foolish or the little things like a baby to confound the wise. We read in Corinthians, but God chose those whom the world considers foolish to shame those who think they are wise. And God chose the puny and the powerless to save the high and to shame the high and mighty. He chose the lowly, the laughable in the world's eyes, nobodies, so that he would shame the somebodies. For he chose what is regarded as insignificant in order to supersede what is regarded as prominent. I want you to do this. So that it means he can use me. I don't know about you, but I feel, my, I feel like sometimes I fit into one of those descriptions that are there. Maybe I feel like a foolish one in the midst of things. Maybe I feel puny and powerless. Maybe I feel like I'm laughable sometimes. Maybe I feel like I'm a nobody. Maybe I, maybe I, I feel like I'm insignificant. But that's exactly where I need to be for God to use me. Because He uses those things to confound the wise. And we see that within the description of, of these magi that came. And then it says that he's pulling pulling down the mindsets of those that elevate them above him. We read in 2 Corinthians, And inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself against the true knowledge of God, we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. We, the enemy, I think, has this process of making us think sometimes that we're smarter than what we are. 
that we think we know a lot, but we need to take those things captive and we need to go, God, you are the true knowledge. You are the one that knows everything. You were before, you'll be after. You knew the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. You have all the knowledge that is available and my knowledge will never supersede that because then I can be humble and when I'm humble, then I can be used by God. Jesus was elevated because he was making himself available, because he was humbling himself and came into this world as a little baby and not like a ruler, a big ruler that shouted his victories like the, the people were expecting. He came in as a baby. Jesus, God could elevate him. We see that therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above, every other, above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father exactly like these men came in when they came in his presence they couldn't do anything other than bow down before him and worship him so God can use anyone in any situation I want you to get a revelation of that he can use anyone that means you anybody here anyone in any situation all we need to do is to make ourselves available he chose these wise men at that time to reveal something to us in, his, in this story. In history, year to day, He chooses you. You are the light of the world. You are the one that He's going to send out. Last week we spoke a little bit about God having a plan for each of us and saying that it's never too early and it's never too late for God to use us, that He can use us at any space, in any time, whenever He is ready, with whatever He's prepped us for, whether we are young or whether we are older. It doesn't matter. He can still use us. And so that's what he was doing with these men. He was using them in a greater story. So what did these wise men do? What was the process that they followed? And what is it that we can learn from them today? I want to look at just a few things quickly. The first is they followed the word. So they had heard the prophecy, they had heard the word, they had heard the plans of a king that is to come, a king that would be bigger than any other kings that had been passed down through the centuries, had been reiterated by the different prophets of God that this was coming. They were studying the word, they were revealing the word, they were knowing what it's all about, who this king would be, what the signs would be in the sky. They were prepping themselves, they had the word, they were following it until the time, until the moment came when they could move with that. But more importantly than heard the word is they believed the word they trusted in the word and then even more important than that is they acted on the word it's one thing to know the word it's another thing to believe the word but faith comes when you do something about the word when you actually step out and trust God that he will lead the way that he will open the door that he will take you into places that you will use the words that you have in your mouth the, whole, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance in the moment the things that we need so maybe you don't know the Bible from the front to the back Maybe you don't know all the things that's in there, but God has planted words in your heart and you are in a place where only you can affect the people around you. And when the moment comes to speak, just trust Him. Don't speak your own wisdom. Not your own wisdom. We've been shown that our wisdom has to be brought down, but we allow God's wisdom to speak through us. We just make ourselves available. The Magi heard and retold these prophecies. They believed in it. And today we are encouraged to study the word, to hear the word, but also apply the word in our life, to live according to faith so that it can bring a difference. So these men were following a light that they saw, but it was eventually the word that directed them. It was the word that gave them the guidance of where they were to go, but they had the light before them, and we'll look at that in a, in a few minutes. So the word of God still leads us today. It is still the one that we rely on, that speaks into our life, that gives us direction, and that opens the door for us, that gives us clarity in the midst of situations, that gives us the strength to follow through, that gives us the promises that we can rely on and that we can walk with. What, they, what the Word did is it brought them to what they were really looking for. They didn't even know what it was. They were just following the signs, but it actually brought them to Jesus. And today, the Word can bring you to Jesus. He can be revealed through the word as he speaks, as he shows us things. God speaks in ways to them or in ways to us that we understand. Isn't it amazing that these were dream interpreters and astrologers? They were watching the stars. And what did God use to speak to them? He spoke to them through dreams and he spoke to them through the stars. And so God will speak to you in a way that you can understand. When you, when you are in a place where you know that it's only God, that can do things. 
Then you come and you pray the prayer that I many times pray. I say, God, I know I'm hard-headed. I know I can't hear. Will you please speak to me in a way that I can understand? I think sometimes we go, how will I know whether it's God speaking to me? Well, he'll speak to you in a way that you will understand. That means he won't speak to us all the same way. He'll use whatever he needs to bring the message across. It might be in a, in a sermon like today, and I believe that he uses this. He uses, in the Bible it told us that they constantly listen to the teachings of the apostles. So we need to get together in the church so that we can hear the message and we can hear it being fed into us. But on a day-to-day -day basis, God will speak to you in ways that you will understand. You just need to allow him to. And then, I think probably where the challenge is, we need to trust that it was him that spoke to us. And take up the opportunities that he gives us. But based on the instructions that he gave us. There's a few things that they did. A process that they followed that we can use today. The first is they heard the word. Secondly, they read and they studied the word. They got it into their spirits. They understood the broader thing of it. Then they believed it. Once they believed it, they acted on it. And then very importantly, they stayed focused to the word. They stayed on course. They kept going until they found what they were searching for. If you are in the midst of a process in your life where we are trying to find answers from God and having clarity in certain things, I want to encourage you, keep going until you find the answer. Don't let go. Don't let the enemy distract you. We spoke about that a little bit last week as well. But keep going until the moment that you find the word, until you find the answers from God. Can I ask Jess if you can join me on stage quickly? There's a scripture that we read about that speaks a little bit about the word like this and, and gives us a little bit of understanding. It says this in, in, in Psalms 9, 119. It says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I love the picture that this brings. So, the word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If you guys can help me. So, the first thing is, it's a lamp onto my path. I need to know where I'm going to. That's my vision. That's my point where I want to go to. The Word has shown me what my purpose is, what my plan in life is, and I know that God has somewhere to take me to. And so I see the lamp ahead of me. I keep the vision ahead of me. But the challenge is there are things that I have to get through where I'm at right now. How do I get there without stumbling? How do I get there on a practical basis? Because that vision might be for the future, but I want to get there. And so the Word says to me that it's a lamp to my feet. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, I can trust the Word. When I'm feeling down, the Word encourages me. It tells me that I'm, I'm an overcomer, that I'm, that I'm the head and not the tail. When I don't have answers in the midst of things, when I've lost in my life, He tells me that I don't have to mourn like those that have, that have no hope. When things come across my path and I don't understand, it gives me clarity and understanding. And so sometimes I might look too much in the day and get lost. And then I look up at the lamp and I see that's where I'm going to. And I just come back onto course again and I start following it. But day by day, I trust in the Word to lead me until I get to the point where He has taken me to. Church, the Word is the thing that carries us. It gives us clarity. It gives us guidance on a day-to-day -day basis. Trust in the Word. The light of the Word is the vision. As I said, it's the picture. It's the dream that God has placed in your heart. It's the place that you want to go to. And He'll clarify that for you if you allow Him to. And then the lamp is the day-to-day -day walk that I do day to day, every day, trusting His Word, spending time in the Word, helping it give me clarity and understanding the direction that I need to go in. The second thing that they did, and we touched on this just a little bit in the previous point, is that they kept going. But they didn't just keep going, they kept going joyfully. Matthew says this, that when they saw the star, these are the, the, the wise men, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They were filled with excitement when they saw the answer, when they saw that the time had finally come, that they were able to meet this king. And today, for many of you, the time has come. Today will be the opportunity that you can meet the king. And so they were excited, they were ready, uh, and they didn't allow distractions to pull them away. You see, there were distractions. They went into the court of Herod, and he had his own plan with him. He wanted to distract him from the journey. He wanted to find his own answers. He wanted to mislead them. He lied to them. And he had his own agenda within their lives, what he wanted to accomplish. And you're going to have those people in your life as well. You're going to have people that will lie to you. You're going to have people that will mistreat you. You're going to have people that have their own agenda of where they want to get to and what they want to do. But we can't allow those things to distract us from what God has called us to. Sometimes it must break us down a bit, but then we do what David did. We encourage ourselves in the Lord. 
We take the challenge that comes and we say, God, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going forward. I'm going to keep applying your word. I'm going to keep reading it daily. I'm going to keep going until I find what I've been looking for. Until I find your word within my heart. But because they focused on the fulfilling of their goal, God was able to redirect them. You see, they were focused on finding what the star was pointing them to. And so even though Herod tried to mislead them and tried to distract them, because they had the ultimate, the ultimate view, the ultimate vision for their life in mind, God could redirect them. Don't go that route. Go this way. Stay safe. Then the next point we want to look at is that they saw the value of Jesus. We can see the value of Jesus. And Pastor Don touched a lot on that in the offering this morning and the value of the gift that we bring. In Matthew we read, The kingdom of heaven is like what happens when someone finds a treasure hidden in a field and buries it again. A person like that is happy and goes and sells everything in order to buy that field. When we find the value, what God has, His Word has, what Jesus has within our life, there is nothing that trumps that. You know, you'll try other different things, but it always brings you back. That's why, you know, in our, in our baby dedication, we always share the scripture with the people that if you raise up your children in the ways of the Lord, they will not depart from it. You know why? Because once you've tasted God, nothing, nothing else satisfies. If you speak the word of God into your children's lives, if you teach, train them up in the word, nothing that they go searching for will ever satisfy. There will always be a God-shaped hope hole in their life. That can only be filled by Him. And so once we have that treasure in our life, it'll keep us strong. It'll keep us focused. So we need to get and do what they did. They were willing for this treasure, for their value, for how big this was. They were willing to get out of their comfort zone. They were willing to step out. They were willing to go into a place that they didn't know about. The second thing is they brought gifts. They brought not only just gifts, they brought valuable gifts. Very valuable gifts in the day. In actual fact, what they think is, is that when, when Joseph and Mary fled with Jesus into Egypt, they needed to be sustained for that time, which was probably about two, two years if we, if we read the history, that those gifts probably sustained them within that time. So it had a great value within their life. And the last thing is they were not afraid of opposition. When you step out for God, you're going to have opposition. Not everybody's going to agree with you. But if we stay focused on the Lamb, if we stay focused on the Word, we use the Word every day, we trust in God to speak to us and to lead us and to guide us, we will get there and the distraction will not, be, will not uh, dis- get us off our target. And then they came to worship. So important. They came to worship. I love this scripture. It says, When they came into the house and saw the young child with Mary, his mother, they were overcome, falling to the ground at, the, at his feet, and they worshipped him. And then they opened the treasure boxes and they came. When they were in his presence, they couldn't do anything but fall on their knees and worship him. They had a worshipful heart. They knew even before they came how big this king was. They must have known how important he was to leave the courts where they were at and come to search for this king. And you see, they were, they were um, important king makers in the day. Because they had so much say within the world, they could give the king advice which would make the king a great king, or they could break him down. They were king makers, and they knew that this was such an important time that they had to be there when this king was established. And so they went to worship him. The next thing they did is that they obeyed God's wisdom rather than that of men. Herod, as we said before, tried to distract him, tried to get them off target, tried to get them somewhere else. And unfortunately, there are going to be a lot of people in your life that are going to want to speak into your life. And it's going to want to tell you things and how you should do things and what you should get offended of and, and how you should react to things. But only the Word of God is true within your life. Only following what God says. And so, you know, many times when, when we find people that are offended, we find that people get offended with what happened in other people's lives. They pick up offense from other people. And we need to guard our hearts. In a time such as this, the enemy is out there. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And if he can do that via offense of someone else, what an easy job for him. He doesn't even have to work hard in your life. 
And so stay true to the word of God. Stay focused. I think sometimes we need blinkers, you know, just like this. That keeps a focus just in front of us so we don't look around. We don't see other things. We just stay focused. God, I see the light. I've got the lamp. I'm going to keep going. Never mind what happens around me. I don't care what happens in their life, what they've gone through, what they've said. I'm just going for what you've called me to. That's what they did. They had the star in front of them. They kept on going and they weren't allowing themselves to be distracted from that. And then the last point I want to look at today is they were ready to give it all. They were readying themselves to give it all. Remember when they went into the space, when they went searching for the king, they did not know what they were going to meet. And they were walking into another king that they did not know, into his courts, asking him, where's the king that's going to replace you? Seems silly. But they walked straight into that. But they were ready to give it all to find this king. They were ready to give their lives and to sacrifice their lives for what would lay ahead. They really didn't have an idea of what the future brought, would bring for them. And so in Ephesians, we've read this. Is, for we, we haven't, did, sorry, this is a different one. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do the, those th good th works which God has predestined, planned beforehand for us, Taking path which he has prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life with which he has prearranged and made ready for us to live. We are ready to give it all for him, to walk in the plans that he has predetermined for us. Some days it'll be up. Some days it'll feel like it's not that great. But if we stay focused on the plans that he got for us, we will eventually reach the prize. We will eventually get everything that God has planned for us. Remember that it's not only about what we have here. It's not only about what we experience in this world. But there's a time to come. And we know that that is a wonderful time. It's a time in the presence of God. And I want to be ready to walk into that destiny of mine. I want to receive everything that he has for me. It's a love for his will of his will in our lives living his commandments seeking his face in a total abandonment of accepting him and his wills in my life these men had a vision that kept them on their way they were willing to travel to another land they were willing to go into another man's court and find the answer and ask about a king that was to come they were willing to give it all then they came into the house and saw the young child with Mary his mother they were overcome falling to the ground at his feet they worshipped him then they opened their treasure checks and boxes full of gifts and presented him with gold frankincense and myrrh there are so many things we can learn from these wise men today there are so many things we can take from their story but the greatest thing the most important thing of all of it is, is that Jesus is the ultimate prize. That he is worth giving it all for. He's worth staying on track for. He's worth going through any troubles. He, he has given us the way to go through his word. He has given us the way how to, how to go through every day-to-day -day thing that we are facing. The, how we learn that, uh, how we uh, work our way through that process on a day-to-day -day basis. He is really and truly the answer, the prize.